get it started. Uh, so my name is Alexander Chenko. I work for Microsoft. I work on uh, cloud technology. Right? And this talk is about uh, keeping simple things simple. So managing complexity in a software. So for those who don't know me, uh, like I got background mostly in game development uh, for 15 years. Last three years I worked on a high frequency trading firm. And now cloud storage Microsoft. So there was a big shift for me when I, I went from C++ to modern C++ and then to C, like kernel C, pure C, right? There's no C++ at all. And I learned a lot, and I want to share what I learned. That's, that's what this talk is about. So that's one reason. Second reason is, like, this is motivation for this talk. Like, not, not all of it, but some of it, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of talk. Well, there used to be a lot of talks, less now. Uh, when people will teach you how to move from C to C++, right? so when people are going to talk about uh, new shiny features of C++, there's zero talks uh, when people talk how to move from C++ to C, or moving from something simple, from something complex to something simple. While there's serious discussions going on like about something called uh, C++, or orthodox C++, where you try to restrict features, like you learn features, but you don't have to use them. Right? So for me, that's like C++ in a nutshell. Like, and uh, on the later CPPCon, Bjarne compared C++ with an onion and said that uh, you only peel layers as you need to. Uh, I think it's a great comparison. It's true. And uh, as with the onion, if you peel too many layers, you're going to cry. <laughs> right? and, and it's very true about C++. Like, I heard a story about a trading company. I wouldn't name it. But they made a conscious decision a few years ago, that, like experts in C++. And for a new piece of software, they were right, and they decided to go with C. Purely on the logic that uh, C++ is getting too complex. A lot of unnecessary complexity gets introduced by developers just because they can. So let's do experiment with POC, and let's see what's going to happen. Right? Uh, the project was success. They probably could write it in C++, like restricted version of C++. But I found it's fascinating. Right? Because they could have chosen any language, but they decided to go with C. So we're going to be learning from C, right? Like what we can learn from simple language. That's, that's the whole talk is about how to keep simple things simple, because there's enough complexity in the software. So we're going to talk about reading code, searching code, writing code, talk about testing, and then finish with flow control. And it's going to be go to in there. Yeah. So uh, as I said, there's a lot of complexity in a software. There's a thing called uh, Conway law, which says that uh, any organization which uh, produces complex system, the system will resemble organization structure. And we all work in big organizations. Like majority of software produced by giant companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon. And I, I saw that this is true, right? I saw it happen, like reorg happens, and you see how code base, code base evolves over time to match new organization structure, right? So we, like the way Microsoft the way Microsoft works, for example, is uh, you have a lot of small autonomous teams and a lot of companies separate this way, and now you have microservices, right? <laughs> uh, the thing is, like, whatever you do, like if you change organization structure or software, it's really hard to reduce complexity. Like, mostly you shift in complexity. You have to think about it as uh, uh, two space, right? Like, you squeeze it, complexity went somewhere, maybe some of it went away uh, without making a mess, uh, maybe not. But complexity stays. So software is complex, and let's see what we do, right? How, how to deal with it. So this is a hypothetical development loop. Like you read code, write code, and then you take next JIRA ticket or whatever <laughs> system you use. And this is uh, well very far from true, because in real life it looks more like this, right? Notice like write few lines. You might not get to step six. You might terminate at step five when your design is, when you just decide that feature is not required. But you're definitely going to spend time reading code. And most of the time, at least like what I found, especially when you're, it's very obvious when you switch jobs and move to the new company. Because when you sit in one company, you get familiar in the code base, and you tend to forget that there's other code around. And people spend a lot of time searching code, right? So like majority of time for me, like searchability is an extremely important concept. Readability is a very important concept, and writability is like absurd, right? And then there's testing, deployment, and whatnot. And typically, you're going to work in established code base, and again, spend most of the time searching, talking to people, reading. 
even if you're lucky and you work on a greenfield project, in a few months' time, you, or well, maybe like one year time, you're going to end up with established code base and you're back to square one you, when you work in established code base. And again, most of the time you spend reading and searching. And as we, as we, with the Conway law, like if you have, say one example of Conway law, if you have four developers writing a compiler, you're going to end up with a four pass compiler, or maybe three pass compiler, because one of them has to be the manager. Right. So like if you're writing system with 10 people, you're going to end up with like piece which you know really well, which you wrote, like neighboring pieces which you know reasonably well, and it's going to be pieces which you don't really know, and you're going to spend most of the time searching and reading. So let's compa compare how we can do this in C++ and in C, like how readability and searchability works. I'll go with simple data retrieval system. That could be image cache, could be like basically retrieving data blob. So there are many ways you can write it. I'll talk about classic object-oriented uh, C++ programming, because in C++ you can write in many ways. You can get as close to C as you want, you can get to very like abstract level and everything in between, right? The C kind of forces you to write in a specific way. You can do crazy stuff, but it's, it's much harder, it's gonna be painful. So this is our input and output. We get a uh, string as an input, and then we get binary blob as a result, this American code. So in C++, we have namespaces, classes, uh, functions, and variables. In C, you have uh, structures, but they're very different structures. Uh, there's so-called plain old data type. You don't have constructors, you don't have destructors, you don't have any complex type. So in C++, because in C++, structure is effectively a class where everything is public. It's, it's still a class. In C, structure is just holds data for you. That's, that's all it does. Structure cannot do any work. So if you design this uh, image server in C++, like classic C++, how it's taught in school, again, because there are many ways to do it, you write your high-level interface, which is going to be like image server, we take input, we return output, we somehow report errors, maybe through exceptions, maybe through error codes. Then you're going to have memory system, cache, and file system. Right. So it's very classic. Then you might start adding inheritance if you want it, because uh, you might realize that memory cache has a lot of in common with file system. Maybe you need to do mock testing with mocks, and now you need dependency injections that so makes sense to extract uh, interface. So uh, hard to name interfaces. Let's go with base, sy base system. Right. Uh, the typical way code is organized in C++ is you put, uh, you take one class per file, or per two files to be precise, because you have header and a C++ file itself. So for, even for this simple uh, project with very basic functionality, if you organize it like in a standard way, you'll end up with uh, eight files. Right? Well, if you do this in C, that's, that's how it's going to look in C. That's how your skeleton is going to look in C. It might grow but it, it's going to grow uh, in a different way. Like if you need to create different uh, like piece of logic and group files together, you can create different C file. Like interface look much simpler, at least for me. So a few things to notice here. Like in C, function is a first class citizen which does work. Because structures are passive, they can't do work. And file names are just hold code, right? They don't represent anything. An interesting result is uh, functions in C++, because this is the only thing which does work, they have very verbose names, because you need to en encode a lot of information in there. Right? While in C++, uh, meaning is spread. So you have namespace, which uh, holds a meaning. In, you have class name, which holds a meaning again. And you have function name. So in C++, it's very common to have uh, like a very short single verb function name. Like if you have, uh, while in C you have the boss name. So in C you know your functions by names. They're literally like, like children, right? Like you wouldn't name your child clear. Like it's gonna be really the boss name. While in uh, C++ you have a memory cache, the clear function, because it, all it does is just clear as memory cache. It makes perfect sense, right? And a very interesting consequences of these verbose names is uh, searchability. Like in Microsoft, uh, there's 100,000 people working in there, a lot, a lot of software. We have a single tool to search code base, right? And search is, uh, it has no knowledge about language. It's simple text search. 
But because of most code base is written in C, at least Windows and, uh, well, most of some Azure, right? Then uh, you can find not only function definition and declaration, you can find all usages as well. Uh, and uh, if you search in our example, image server try memory cache, that's probably going to be the only hit. While with C++, you have to search by class name, colon, colon, function name, and usage is going to be extremely hard to find. Like, you have to rely on an ID effectively, because it's, I don't know any other way. Like, the example with clear function, like if you search for clear, like, well, good luck, right? So let's go to readability. Uh, readability depends on a lot of different things, uh, like how code is organized, uh, how original design was built, uh, but this, like, it doesn't matter, because uh, there's going to be one huge difference between C and C++, is at least what I found. Uh, working in, I'm talking, again, I'm talking about like well-written C++ and well-written C, because you can make mess in any language. And, right. There are going to be far fewer abstractions less in C. Uh, and I think the main reason for it, because there's no constructors and destructors. Uh, it's the way uh, like C++ code is written is you try to hide unnecessary or unimportant code, and you just create helper objects, you pass through constructor, uh, you pass all data through constructor, and now you've hidden it, like all these functor objects and whatnot. While in C, there's uh, no such thing, and there's no culture to hide an important code either. You literally, when you read your co code in C, you read it like a book, uh, effectively, because there's going to be very few levels of indirections. Well, if you read it in C++, the level of indirection could be very deep, or could be shallow, depending on the uh, author, but it could be quite deep. And I'm not even talking about templates, right? Like that's, that's whole next level. So the upside I found while switching from C to C++ is uh, it's easier to separate business logic in C++. And if, C++, if it's well written C++ code base, it's easy to look at the function and uh, get the general idea of what it's doing. And partially because of this, uh, like well written C++ code, it doesn't have many comments. Oh, there was a push that you have to describe why your function is doing what it's doing instead of describing what it's doing, because your names are sufficient, uh, right? And while in C, it's uh, it's like nothing up my sleeve. Like, well, here it is. Like, here's I'm taking lock. Here's I'm unlocking. Right? Like, so it's more like a mesh of everything, which. Uh, as a result, it's still common to write uh, comments explaining what function is doing uh, at the beginning of the function. Function get b gets bigger, gets more verbose. Uh, but the one massive upside for me, like I spend most of my career optimizing code, and uh, typically it's someone else's code, uh, not mine. And so when you're optimizing something, like you want as few abstractions less as possible. So when everything is in there, it's much easier to read and understand. So that's one, one thing, uh, like if you want to take one thing from this uh, talk, is uh, consider moving like your C++ or object-oriented programming, moving more towards uh, free functions. That's what I was like, doing in the last few years, I found very useful. So you still do interfaces and uh, like implementation for those interfaces, but try to avoid private functions and move code to free functions. So that's more like C uh, merging with C++. So let's talk about writing code. Like, do you recognize this guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Vianney, yeah. So for me, C++ was always considered to be a safer language than C. Like, there's a lot of examples how you can shoot yourself in the foot. You can do this in C++, but some things it's much, much harder to do. And that, like, if you go to the conference, that's indeed the case, like a lot of people talking about safety. There's a, a lot of major features on C++. They come in from safety. Like, let's improve safety. Uh, there are other ways to do it though, so I'll show you one way how we do this at Microsoft. It's not like it's available outside of Microsoft as well. So if you're using Visual Studio, like if you compile into Microsoft, there's a compi compiler switch uh, slash analyze. So you can just click uh, there and say analyze my code. And this analysis, uh, or at least part of this analysis, requires some uh, source code annotation language, which is called cell. Like let's, let's go through a few examples. Uh, so cell, the purpose of cell is it's machine friendly, but it's also human friendly. That's a way for programmer to declare intent that like what function is doing. And then because machine friendly, tools can help you and uh, well, hopefully find bugs for you. So here's one example. 
So in this e example, you declare input parameter, which is a pointer, and a tool can validate for you that A, pointer is not null, and B, the data you pass in is initialized. And you get a warning if it's not the case. Like pretty much the entire Microsoft code is going through this as, as part of the build step, and this, this has to be fixed, right? Like in C++, uh, different ways to, you can fix it. Like obviously you can avoid pointers completely, you can pass by reference, and you cannot have null references until you do have null references and get undefined behavior. Uh, like you can use uh, const. Uh, it's harder to test if data is initialized because you have to rely on uh, well, sanitizers effectively, or while grind. Like, you can kind of mitigate, but like with, with this tool, it helps, right? And it's very simple, right? Like you're not changing code much, you're just saying, this is my input parameter. So here's an example of optional input parameter where whoever is consuming this parameter, they have to check because parameter could be null. In this case, I'm saying I'm not passing this parameter. And again, if you didn't check, then you're going to get a warning from the compiler. Again, like annotation is very concise, right? Like, and it's readable. It, it reads like in English. Like underneath a ton of macros, obviously, but you don't have to look at it. And when you build with uh, Visual Studio, and when you get uh, warnings uh, from it, like part, part of those warnings because STL uh, from Visual Studio is heavily annotated. So you get some of those warnings because of this. So in C++, that's not really alternative. You can have null object, and you pass object by reference, but you can't really check if a uh, consuming code is checking for this null object and doing something sensible with it. So you have to rely on tests. So here's an example out parameter. Like you pass memory and saying you have to write something into it. That's a mandatory output parameter. If function didn't write anything to it, then you get a warning from the compiler. Again, like very simple to declare, very readable. Is this C code? Uh, you can do the same in C++. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Well, that, that's C++ example, I think. Yeah, well, you can do the same in C++, the same annotation work for C++. Like in C++, it's kind of mitigated, like classical approach, it's written by value, return tuples, so you can mitigate it to some extent by language itself. Here's an example of a pointer which is gonna be initialized when you return some complex structure. Again, you can get uh, warnings from the compiler when uh, whoever is consuming or didn't initialize it correctly. Like in C++, it's typically handled by returning container uh, or returning unique pointer, but then you have to move ownership. Uh, but that's another way how you do it. So it's supposedly unsafe, but you can make it much safer with annotations. Uh, so here's an example how you annotate function behavior, and slightly more involved. Uh, again, it, like I probably don't need to explain what it does because you can just read it and guess, right? Like, like first parameter is destination and we write and count is how much data we write into it. Well, and second parameter is source and count is how much we read. See, that's very, very obvious. Like there's a lot of ways to deal with this in C++. You can use stand containers, you can use, like, if you like and you have C++20, you can use span, stream view, ranges, all sorts of things. Right. So here's an example how to do this with span, for example. Right. So for me, the most useful, those are simple examples, right? For me, the most useful ones are related to locks. Like I work in kernel land, kernel is multi-threaded, heavily multi-threaded, so I have to live with multi-threaded. Multi I have to live with uh, different IQL levels as well, but that's like kernel specific. But with locks, you can do a smart annotation saying this piece of memory, this part of memory is protected by this lock. And if you try to access this memory without taking the lock, then compiler will complain. Or you can mark specific variables saying this is interlocked and you have to use interlocked operations to work with this memory. Or you can say this is protected only for write and but not for read. And again, compiler is gonna help you. So I found this incredibly useful. Like this, this finds box. And again, it's not like you annotate your data structure, you're not annotating every piece of code which is using it. 
Like in C++, the classical approach is to use scope logs, but again, if you forgot to take scope log, well, bad luck, you have to rely on thread sanitizer, which is great, by the way. Uh, Google introduced uh, something similar in upsell library. Like I haven't tried it. It's there. I hope it works. Like the annotations looks very similar. So you're basically saying this memory is protected, and then I assume they have some tool which they run and uh, tool identifies it. Here's another, another example how you annotate. So you can say, well, this function is going to take the log. So if log is already taken and static analysis will check it for you, but then it's going to complain. Or you can say this function requires log to be taken. Again, it will find it. Or you can say, well, my, my, my code is complex enough so static analyzer cannot figure it out, or maybe I'm using some modern C++ constructs, in which case I just give a hint to the compiler saying, assume log is taken. Right. So let's move to testing. Like before I go about testing, I have to talk about tools because that's a big part of how we test code, how everyone tests code. Like in Microsoft, there's uh, two tools called, one is called driver verifier, second is called application verifier. Driver is when you write Windows drivers, and application verifier is for user land. It does validation, so it's somewhat similar to bulk grind, like you run your application under bulk grind and it does a lot of checks, and if it finds problem, it's just gonna stop, right? Uh, driver verifier is slightly different because it, it's going to stress your driver, right? For example, it's going to inject some memory allocation failures and see that you're handling it correctly or inject some other failures into your system. So it's basically stressing your driver. Like I think it's same as application verifier. So it does some like static checking. Well, not static, but the validation layer, but also stress stresses it. Uh, there's also sanitizers. Like if you're not, not using sanitizers, you should, right? Uh, it's available in uh, Visual Studio now as well. In Visual Studio 2019, uh, you can use address sanitizer, which is great. <coughs> I think it's only for 32-bit uh, now, but they're working on getting 64-bit, and they're working on uh, UBSUN as well. So testing. Like, again, like last uh, three, four years, I was writing modern C++, very standard testing approach, mocks, uh, dependency injection. It came from Java, like based on this classical book. So you have unit test as a foundation, and then integration test, and end-to-end uh, -end tests. And the typical way to do uh, unit tests is use dependency injection. So you have, like in C++, you have to define interfaces. In Java, you don't have to, because you can effectively override every function. That, it works. There are some problems with this approach. Approach works in general. I want to show you a different way how to test, because like, when, when I, I was, was wondering how people write tests for C code. Like, unless it's a simple function where you can just check return result, that's obvious how to test, right? But if you have complex piece of software with state, how you test C code? Like, you can have uh, function pointers, obviously, and re-implement virtual table or whatever table you want, but it's gonna be ugly. Surely there are other nicer ways to do it, or different ways to do it. So one way to do it is what we do when we test drivers, it kind of forces us to do it, is uh, say, imagine in your program you have a global state, right? And you have uh, some test state attached to this global state. Uh, like for, for argument's sake, it could be a few integers and a uh, few Boolean flags, right? So code which uh, your tests can access those integers and they can sense data through them and they can change flags and inject behavior into your production code. So when you say switch one flag on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say I'm injecting this specific fail condition into your code. So it's kind of like smart mocks in C++. If you're, like, if you're working in C++ and you're consuming library which came with a, a test uh, functionality, so you don't have to mock everything by yourself, you're really lucky. Right? Uh, in this case, it's kind of similar. You, you inject, you're not mocking everything, you're injecting behavior. And when you inject behavior, you're thinking about real life scenarios. Say in our memory cache, like I want to test what, what happens if I cannot find uh, data in a cache. So I'm going to inject, inject this specific behavior and I write, I'm going to write a piece of code in production code, which uh, could be downside because you now you're merging your test code and production code. But, well, you can kind of isolate it, but still. Uh, but you inject in real life scenario instead of just mock, 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 and then like test, uh, in, intercept another function and check that it calls with what it's supposed to call with specific parameters. 
So that's, for me, that's like another big upside. Like I found that's very useful testing technique because you're thinking about real life scenarios and then your test code reuses those test scenarios. So you're saying, I'm working in multi-component system, let's put how this component can fail. Okay, there's like 10 fail conditions. So I'm just gonna implement uh, like 10 of them. I got 10 flags or some, some way to inject it, maybe not through flags. And then all my tests rely on it. So you're not, you're not have, you don't have mocks. As long as you're, you, you can rewrite your production code completely, as long as it implements the same test functionality, the same test API, which is very narrow in comparison to mocks. Uh, like it's still, everything's still gonna work. While if you mock everything, now you have very rigid uh, coupling between uh, test code and production code, uh, which reduces your velocity. So this technique is extremely useful. I highly recommend to try it. So that's it, good for testing common cases. Not so good if you need to test cascading failure because like, it's, it's very specific use case. In this case, uh, in C++ mocks would work better, I think. Interleaving production test code kind of scary. You can do like obviously if def, uh, if it's not final release built, uh, then we compile it in, right? Still it kind of merge into it with your code, so it's not as nice as C++ where production code is production code. Yeah. Now, let's talk about flow control, which could be summarized as uh, go to considered useful, surprisingly enough. So the first day I started Microsoft, I looked at the code base, I saw GoTo. I was like, oh, that's gonna be great. You know? <laughs> so the second day I saw GoTo jumping up, it was like, it kept getting better. <laughs> so I won't talk about case jumping up, because uh, that's a bit scary. I'll talk about case jumping down. There's also an interesting relationship between, uh, like, you know, in C, like, before C99, you have to declare variables at the beginning of the function. In C99, now you can declare them everywhere. Uh, and uh, so there's a relationship between declaring variables at the beginning of the function and go-tos. Right? I'll, I'll show you why. So uh, in C, you don't have constructors and destructors. And it's really, you only appreciate uh, like usefulness of those tools when, you are take, when they're taken from you, right? Because <laughs> uh, I'm so used to them. Like, it's, like, how do you clean up resources? Like, you wanna, I want to return, and now I have to do all those frees, or what, like, it's, it's, it's such a use, it's one of the most com commonly used programming patterns in uh, C++, I think. So not, not visitors, not uh, those high-level patterns, but just simple constructor, destructor, and RII, right? So let's look at specific, like simple example on C++, how it, how it works, right? So you allocate some memory, you put it in unique pointer, which is RIA, and then if something bad happens, well, in this case, you have a bunch of conditions, bunch of nested conditions, which is really, could, could get really ugly as if you have a lot of those conditions, right? So what you can do instead is lean on RII and uh, do this. So you do early return, and you didn't leak any memory because unique pointer did the right thing and you're really happy. So now in C, you do the same thing and great, you get a memory leak. And now you have to fix your memory leak because some tool found you or hopefully not bug report. So you fix it by this. So yeah, well, here's my free, right? And all well and good until you get a bunch of those memory blocks and you get a bunch of return statements and you can still forget some of them and it gets very, very bored and ugly. Uh, so now go to, to the rescue. You can do this instead, right? So you, 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 you return and look, this is effectively a uh, destructor, right? So exit point is effectively destructor here. And uh, constructor is kind of shifted because you got more flexibility. Yeah? But so with a slightly more involved example, it's gonna look like this. So if something bad happens, like you wanna handle an error, maybe you log something, maybe you log at the exit pass, you, you can have multiple labels as well. And then you just jump to this label. Like once you get used to this pattern, it's really a convenient pattern. So it's been used in C++ code bases and it looks reasonably organic, right? I wouldn't say it's ugly. And the upside, it works really nicely with uh, return codes, right? Because everything just works. You, re you initialize your return code and your function returns your NT status well, because it's what functions do, they return an error code. And you, you got single exit point as well, much easier to debug if you wanna know what, when function gets to the end, you just put breakpoint in there. It's really convenient technique. Like it's like 
it's kind of sad that Go2 got this bad reputation and you get frowned if you put it any, putting a code base, but I found this really useful. Like it's really useful for handling the uh, array cases as well. So in this case, I'm handling memory, but like when you go through your code pass and now you need to handle errors, Go2 is extremely useful for this case as well. Uh, in C++ and uh, contracts, it's kind of mixed bag. Uh, there was a talk on CppCon uh, from Hepsata about uh, error codes and exceptions, how one third of developers uh, don't use exceptions, they're restricted. One third of them don't use error codes. Uh, so kind of like they use both and it gets merged and it gets really ugly. But that's what we live with. There are some proposals to introduce exception, exceptions light er behavior for error codes. So some sort of mix which is performant enough. Yeah. So I think, I think uh, like for error handling, go to concept is, is much cleaner and uh, clear. Like it takes some time to get used to it, but it's really nice. Yeah. Well, closing. So keep your code simple and test simple. Remember, searchability is extremely important. Uh, your fellow developers will thank you. And if they can find something in your code base without asking you, you're going to be you know, happy as well. Use free functions as much as possible. Again, like if you want to take one thing from this talk, take this free function approach. It's great. Safety features can be bolted on top of unsafe language. Well, arguably, maybe you can do better if you make it part of the language. But I found it adds a lot of value with uh, very small overhead. Like you can add a lot of overhead, and at some point you get this point of, well, it's not adding that much value. But for initial investment, like Locke says, it, it's huge. Right? And uh, don't shy to learn from simple languages. Like I learned a lot, right? Even though C++ is considered to be much more advanced, it, it's not the case. It's, they, they have to be treated as different languages, I think. So that's it from me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Are you forced to use C, or can you use C++? Well, <laughs> oh, in, 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 in kernel, in kernel space, uh, you write C. Well, code base is C, so you have to write C. Uh, for like example, you, like GCC uses C++ more for this. Can you do the same in kernel? You can, I think. I, I think it's possible now. I, I, I was thinking about it. I don't really, like, say you can use C++ in kernel, but you cannot use STL, right? Like how much value you're getting from uh, C++? It, it, it's, it's like, well, you're getting some, but